Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining the Hertog Foundation and the Institute for the Study of War for our joint session tonight, an overview of the Hertog War Studies Program and Question and Answer, followed by Dr. Kim Kagan's conversation with General H.R. McMaster, and a chance for you to ask him questions as well. I'm Brian babcock Loomis, the director of the General David H. Petraeus Center for Emerging Leaders at the Institute for the Study of War. I joined ISW after a 24-year career in uniform as a U.S. Army intelligence officer, and I oversee all of the educational programs at ISW, including our Hertog War Studies program. Please submit your questions about War Studies, Hertog's other summer 2022 programs, and the application process using the Q&A function found in the bottom Zoom menu bar. We will be monitoring the Q&A and will answer shorter questions directly. I'll address more complex ones after my opening presentation when I'll be joined by the Hertog Foundation's Executive Director, Cheryl Miller. There's no need to wait to submit questions. Start sending them in now. And as you already know, we're also raffling off three copies of General McMaster's latest book, so watch the chat to see if you've won. The Hertog Foundation offers several programs over the summer. As you'll see, some are residential here in Washington, D.C., and others are online. They also require different time commitments and are open to different cohorts of students, recent graduates, and young professionals. This evening, I'll focus on the War Studies program. If you have questions about political studies or the other programs, Ms. Miller can answer those during the Q&A. The War Studies program is open to those about to graduate this spring in the class of 2022, rising seniors, and by exception, rising juniors. If you're either older or younger than that window, you'll need to apply for other programs. The War Studies program is here in Washington, D.C. for two weeks at the end of July and beginning of August. All costs of the program are fully funded for participants. We cover your travel to D.C., put you up in a hotel, provide three meals a day, and provide you with all of the course materials. We also offer a $1,500 stipend. The War Studies program is academically intense. You will spend eight hours a day in the seminar with your peers and four to five faculty. Every night you'll be doing around 300 pages of reading for the next day. The goal of the program is to give you the language and logic to understand war as a human phenomenon. We believe that American society would be well served to have more civilians able to understand military decision making. The course starts with the age of Napoleon, considers the military theorist Clausewitz, among others, then carries on through history to the present day and even into the future of war. You will immerse yourself in military terminology, learning how to read military maps and symbols, and understanding the difference between a platoon and a division. One of the highlights of the program is that we take what the military calls a staff ride to the Gettysburg battlefield, where the students will each assume roles from the battle and brief their peers on a particular aspect of the fight or the decision making of a particular commander. This is much more in depth than a battlefield tour you would get from the guides if you visit on your own. There are three core faculty, Dr. Kim Kagan, Dr. Fred Kagan, and General Jim Dubik. The Kagans are both military historians and I can personally attest to their skill as teachers from when I had each of them when I was a cadet at West Point when they were on faculty 20 years ago. General Dubik had a long and distinguished career in uniform, commanding at every echelon from company to corps. He also had a tour teaching philosophy to cadets at West Point, and when he retired from the Army, he went back to grad school to earn his PhD in philosophy, and he's literally written the book on just war theory. The three of them are a skilled team when it comes to facilitating the conversation in the classroom. These are the confirmed speakers we've already lined up for this summer. Among them are hundreds of years of experience leading in uniform. General Allen was the first U.S. Marine to command a theater of war in Afghanistan. General McChrystal was both commander of NATO troops in Afghanistan and all U.S. special operations troops around the globe. You'll hear from General McMaster this evening as a teaser for the sort of conversation you'll get to have with him if you join the War Studies cohort. General Nagata led the most elite special operations unit in the US military and has thought deeply about the future of conflict. General Petraeus commanded in Iraq, Afghanistan, the wider Middle East, and directed the CIA. General Scaparati was the Supreme Allied Commander leading all NATO forces, and he'll be a guest faculty member for most of the second week of the course. 
The others will each join for two to three hours of seminar with the students, sharing their insights on leadership in war. And they always have a robust Q&A session with uh, the students. Now, you don't have much time until applications are due on March 1st. When you submit your application at hertogfoundation.org, it's a single application for all programs. That being said, you should tailor your application to your first choice program. If war studies is your first choice and you make it to the interview stage, you'll then interview with us at ISW rather than with the Hertog Selection Committee. It is possible to receive offers to participate in multiple Hertog summer programs. For example, an applicant might be selected by ISW to participate in war studies and by the Hertog Foundation to participate in their online summer course on US-China competition, for instance. So long as the two programs do not have conflicting dates, applicants can accept both offers. The application is relatively straightforward, but there are a few important things to note. In particular, the War Studies program requires two letters of recommendation, and we are firm in having that be uh, the minimum of two, while the other programs do not require two letters. Likewise, War Studies allows for writing samples up to 20 pages long, while the other programs are capped at 10 pages. In addition, you'll submit things like your resume or CV and, and your unofficial transcript, as well as the statement of purpose that I'll talk about on the next slide. Now, War Studies accepts only the strongest applicants. If your GPA is slightly below the 3.7, but you're a strong writer and will have stellar letters of recommendation, then by all means apply. We genuinely look for students of all academic backgrounds, not just history or political science, though those are certainly well represented among the cohort. The diversity of experience that, uh, that the cohort brings is a real richness to the conversation in the classroom. Do pay close attention to the prompt for writing the personal statement if you are applying to war studies as your first choice. We are looking for how you fit into war studies and how it will help you going forward. On the writing sample, it does not need to be an international affairs focused sample. If your best writing is an English essay about poetry, give us that. Whatever is your strongest writing is what we want to see. If you become a member of the War Studies community, your time with ISW does not end at the conclusion of two weeks in the classroom. We have fully funded full-time fellowships that bring alumni into ISW as employees who research the most important national security topics of the day. Currently, one of our War Studies alumni leads the Turkey research portfolio at ISW and is becoming an expert in her field. This is a unique component of the War Studies program. Likewise, you're eligible to come back for advanced programs, typically four to five day seminars on either historical or contemporary topics. They've run the gamut from the Islamic State or the Eastern Front of World War II to Russian hybrid warfare and D-Day. And beyond the 160 plus War Studies alumni, you join the wider community of nearly 1,500 Hertog alumni who have gone on to interesting careers across sectors and around the globe. There are emerging leaders in the public and private sector, politics, the law, the military, among many others. The Hertog Foundation does a great job of creating a real sense of community for those who've come through its programs. With that, Ms. Miller will join me and we'll take your questions. I can see that we've already got a number in the chat. All right, so Brian, I'll start out with some questions for you. I think the first one is easy, which is, are international students eligible to apply? Absolutely, they are welcome to apply. So what we find is that there is a true richness and diversity having students, not just from the United States, but around the globe. So by all means, if you're an international student, please do submit an application. One thing I should note is that um, grad, um, international applicants should take in, uh, keep in mind the difficulty, especially in our, our pandemic era, of um, dealing with the paperwork. I don't believe that ISW can help you on the visa side. Is that right, Brian? Yeah, that's, that's accurate. Yeah, and unfortunately, that's true for us as well at Hertog. The other thing is, in order to pay you a stipend, um, we have to... Um, have you submit either a social security number, which if you're an international student, you probably don't have unless you're already studying here in the US, or you have to apply for what's called an individual tax identification number. And you have to get that through the IRS. 
That's a difficult process. And unfortunately, there's limited amount that we can do to help you with it. Like the IRS will not work with us directly on your file because it is your file, not ours. And they would be worried about like us stealing your identity or some such. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. For some fellows, that can be so difficult that they decide to forfeit the stipend. There are other things that we might be able to work out, but that's something that you should keep in mind. Um, if you're accepted, I encourage you to get started on that paperwork right away because it's much slower than usual. All right, next question for you, Brian. So um, earlier you phrased it, um, eligibility as older, younger than rising senior, junior. And um, Quinn Pearson, who's asking this question notes that or he or she, I don't know, um, is a non-traditional student and wants to know if there is an age cutoff for the War Studies program. No, great question. It's, it's not an age cutoff. It really is where you are in your educational process. So if you are a non-traditional student and you are a rising junior, senior, or about to graduate, you are in fact eligible. So by all means apply. Great. And then we have a question from anonymous attendee. I am a student in Canada and my GPA is around 3.5. I was not aware that the GPA requirement was 3.7. Do you think I still have a chance with a good writing sample and references? With exa that's exactly the point I would make. With a good writing sample and strong references, by all means, submit that application. Great. Um, and we have a question from Gabriel Birdie. He asks, have successful applicants to war studies written their statement of purpose more like a cover letter, tightly focused on qualifications and how you fit at war studies, or more like a college student graduate school statement of purpose with more of a narrative, brings up personal history and backgrounds? I would say it's generally more of the latter. The, uh, the more narrative statement of purpose is what we tend to see as the most successful applicants. And I would just say that that's true, too, of applying to political studies um, or to our other summer fellowships. You should keep in mind um, that you only have to apply, you only have to submit one personal statement. So if you're applying to both Brian's program, war studies, and you're also interested in applying to a summer course, maybe you're interested in that China course I just mentioned. Um, but if you're applying first choice for uh, Brian's program, you should really focus on war studies. So tailor that statement of interest. Um, to the program that is your first choice. Oh, and we also, Brian, we have a number of questions about graduate students and whether they are eligible for the War Studies program. Unfortunately, on that front, the answer is no. We are very much focused on this opportunity being for the undergraduate population. Yes, so if you are a graduate student, unfortunately, War Studies um, and Political Studies are not available to you. However, the summer courses are all, um, graduate students are eligible for all of our summer courses. So I do encourage you to look at those programs. We also offer a number of intercession programs throughout the year that have less restrictive eligibility than um, these two residential programs. So please look at those. All right, next question for you, Brian. I was excited to see ISW fellowships available for the most excellent War Studies graduates. War Studies is already a competitive program. If admitted, what does excellence in these fellows look like? So the, the folks that go on from uh, war studies participants who are already exceptional and then come on as fellows at ISW um, have a clear vision for how they want to contribute to the national security debate. They know that they want to deepen their experience. They come in, they join ISW. And what we do is we very much curate a unique developmental experience for those fellows. And depending on where they are, because sometimes the fellows might be somebody who did war studies five years ago, and they come back and become a fellow at ISW. And so they might be a little more senior in their career path. And so how we tailor the experience to them might be a little bit different. Or if someone is coming, they, they graduate undergrad this summer, they do war studies with us, and then they apply and become a fellow at ISW, they could be working full-time at ISW within six months, right, of graduation. I mean, they could, be, they could be on the team immersed in open source intelligence analysis. And that's really what makes ISW unique is that we have a number of tech partnerships and we have some methodologies that really are world-class cutting edge ways of thinking about data and how it is we understand potential adversaries around the globe. 
Uh, we have, we're very well known for our Russia team. Uh, we do a lot of really good work on the Middle East as well. Um, and we bring those folks into those teams and they get to grow their skills embedded in those research teams uh, as a fellow for a year, two years, and some stay far beyond that. And we, we've had folks stay at ISW long-term after their fellowship even. And one student asks, um, what are my chances of admissions to war studies based on the past year's application rates? I know it's highly competitive. <laughs> <laughs> it's highly competitive. Yeah. Um, it is always a tough cut. And we agonize every year over who it is that's going to make it into this cohort because it is always a tough cut. Um, but you, the only way you find out if you're going to make it in is if you submit an application, right? So give it a go. We look forward to reading those applications and make our job hard by giving us good applications. Absolutely. Um, you are part of a small cohort um, for war studies. So I think, right, each year it's about eight, between 18 and 20 fellows. That's correct, yes. That's true of all of our programs. Um, political studies is our largest cohort program. We're going to be accepting 36 fellows this year um, to meet growing demand for the program. Um, but those 36 fellows will be divided into two, co two cohorts of 18. So they'll be doing the program at the same time, but they'll be in different classes. Um, so that we can still have that small style seminar course. Um, our summer courses are all capped at 15. We feel that especially for online programs, it's very important to keep that small cohort. But the trade-off of the small cohort and that deeper experience it provides is that we can't take as many qualified applicants as we'd like to. So we're trying to expand every year to take more of you. Keep in mind, it's highly competitive and you know, turn in the best application that you can. Because as Brian said, the only way you can know is if you apply. All right, I got a question here from Jeff Mackey. He asked, could you provide a more specific overview of program content? What does the time commitment and schedule look like throughout the two-week war studies program? Uh, sure, you will <laughs> not have any free time. <laughs> you will be getting up in the morning, having breakfast at your hotel, coming to ISW's headquarters, being in the classroom by 9 o'clock, 9.30, you're in seminar until lunch. We cater and bring lunch to you. So it's just a quick break, get some lunch, get right back into seminar, running all the way through until 5 p.m., have dinner. Then you go back to the hotel and we give you a space where all of you can gather and study together. There'll be a, a conference room dedicated for that uh, for every evening. So you can read in your room on your own, but we also encourage you to get together and study as a group in the evenings. And you'll be studying from the time you're done with dinner until you go to bed, and you'll have barely had enough time to get all the reading done before you, you know, wash, rinse, repeat, and do it the next day. Um, and in the midst of the program, we don't even take a full weekend. We give you one day off uh, in the middle of the of the session, so it's six it's six days straight, a day off, seven days uh, sprint. So it is intense throughout. Um, you get that one reading day in the middle. Yeah, and that intensity is true of all of our residential programs. They are all full-time commitments. That's why we're providing you the housing and the stipend, because your job that for that duration of time that you're with us is to study cool texts and learn from great teachers and engage with awesome peers. Um, if you're looking to spend the rest of your summer um, on another commitment, say an internship or an independent research project, then we really do encourage you to look at the summer courses because those are designed with the idea that your full-time commitment during the day is going to be something else. The summer courses are online, so you can just flip on your computer. They're in the evenings on Eastern time, of course, so you'll have to adjust for time zone. But in general, the, the intention is that you can do those. You can have a resident or a educational experience during the summer, but you don't have to commit your full time to it. So um, you, if you're doing more studies, you're going to assign away that your life for two weeks to Fred and Kim Kagan and General Dubik and Brian. Um, we have a great question from Nicholas Mujo, which I think is really specific to a lot of students of war studies. He asked, should I apply if I'm waiting for orders to attend OCS after graduating in May? So the, the, the thing that I almost need to clarify is, is it possible that you'll get pulled and go to OCS sometime before August, uh, which is tricky. Um, but absolutely, we have plenty of 
successful applicants who have been pending OCS. Uh, we haven't, we've had a number of folks come through and uh, then go on to serve in uniform. So that's, that's not in any way um, uh, a roadblock to, to being a part of the program. Great. And we have a question from Nolan Musselwhite. Are language requirements a plus for war studies admissions and ISW fellowships afterwards? And if so, are they specific languages? So specific to the war studies program itself, we are not, uh, it, certainly knowing languages is never a bad thing, right? It's, it's a demonstration of your academic ability, your commitment to learning, right? All of that is really important. Um, and so that's, that certainly uh, strengthens your application. Um, when it comes to uh, those who complete war studies and might be applying to come on fellowships uh, as an alum of the war studies program, then yes, um, having language skills is certainly valuable in that piece of the process. Um, the kinds of languages that we uh, prioritize right now, Russian is, is certainly top, Arabic, um, Farsi is great, um, any of the languages of the former Soviet Union, um, Chinese, because we're, we're, ex we're building out a China portfolio, so that's going to be an important language skill that we're looking for. Turkish is another one. Um, so those are some of the languages. Uh, Dari and Pashto, I should, shouldn't uh, forget, because we still have an Afghanistan portfolio as well uh, that we follow uh, the developments in, in Afghanistan. So those are some of the languages that are, that are certainly valuable for folks who go on to spend time at ISW. Yeah, we have a question from Lauren Stahl that kind of piggybacks on that. He asks, I'm a current um, defense contractor and not a current student. Is there a good way for me to still work with um, ISW or with war studies? So with the war studies program, unfortunately, as we've already talked about, the window is closed. Yeah. Um, that being said, in my hat as the director of the Petraea Center, uh, that houses war studies and all of the other educational programs, we are in the midst of building out additional programming to expand beyond the you know, undergraduate student population we target with the war studies program. So what I would say is follow us on social media, uh, understanding, you know, understandingwar.org is our website, um, because there will be new programs emerging that are the kinds of things you might be interested in and want to get involved with given uh, your interests and how they overlap with ISW. Yeah, and I just put ISW's website in the chat so you can check that out and also look for employment opportunities that may Absolutely. show up. So um, question, Brian, should applicants expect any COVID precautions or restrictions to be in effect during the war studies program? It's a million dollar so, question. Absolutely. It's a, it's a good one. And this is where we have always followed the public health guidance, right? Whatever the policy is that's in place at the time of the War Studies program. And in 2020, at the, the early waves of the pandemic, we did have to go 100% remote back in 2020. In 2021, even with the state of play with the public health emergency, uh, essentially, we were just before the Delta wave really had taken off last year, if you remember. We were able to bring everyone in person. Um, and at that point, when a mask mandate for Washington, D.C. was put in place, well, we all masked up, right? And we had enough space where everybody was masked. We were able to be responsible. We followed all the public health guidance. We kept everybody safe. Nobody got COVID. Um, and so we, we do take that very seriously. Um, but we will follow whatever the public health guidance is at the time of the program in late July and early August. Yeah, and I should just say, if you're interested in the political studies program or the words that made us, I feel confident that we're going to have an in-person program. We had an in-person program um, last summer with restrictions in effect. Nobody got COVID at that program either, knock on wood, saying that feels like tempting fate. Um, and, but we were able to have a great experience, um, notwithstanding uh, the public health situation. We're also running an in-person program right now, not literally right now, but this fall and winter. Um, and again, we haven't had any difficulties as cases have gone up. Sometimes we move online, sometimes we're back in person. So we're flexible and we're going to commit to you having some kind of experience, but in all likelihood, an in-person experience. Um, we do follow DC health guidelines, so do um, you know watch out for that. Our mask mandate is um, getting relaxed um, come March 1st, and I'm hoping that that's going to be the trend going forward. 
Um, Brian, question. I'm really interested in the nature of warfare as a human phenomenon, but I don't, as of now, plan to pursue a career in national security. Am I still a good candidate for war studies? The answer is absolutely. Um, one of the sort of philosophies underpinning this program is that we want people familiar with national security issues, no matter what career path they are on, right? And because we, we believe in the need for an informed citizenry. And we want civilians able to hold their elected and appointed representatives accountable when it comes to the use and employment of military force. And so if you're not planning to go on that path, that's okay. That's not uh, something that's gonna preclude you from being a part of this course. And you'll bring an interesting perspective to the conversation, which is exactly what we're looking for. And then we have another question. War study sounds like it incorporates a lot of um, contemporary concerns. Do students read texts about the classic foundations of war? What does that component of the program look like? So we absolutely take an interdisciplinary approach to the understanding of war, which is why we call it war studies and not military history, but there is a, a heavy component of military history in it. Um, we also really bring in the actual text when it comes to military theorists. I mentioned in uh, the prepared remarks that we read Clausewitz, and that is something that is a foundational sort of understanding of how we understand war in the modern context really goes back to some of the German military theorists like Clausewitz. And he's not the only one we read. Um, and it includes more recent uh, theories about war when it comes to air power theory or operational art, which the, the Soviets pioneered in the interwar period between World War I and World War II. So we do absolutely engage with the text. We engage with historical writings. Um, we really take that interdisciplinary approach. We even bring in a little bit of math when it comes to chaos theory and Clausewitz. And um, I mean, these are texts that Kim made me read when I was writing my undergraduate thesis <laughs> with her um, back in, in 2001. Um, and I got to dust those off when I joined the team here at ISW. So yeah, we absolutely engage with the seminal texts of the discipline. Absolutely. And just as a reminder, if you go to the Hertog War Studies page on the Hertog Foundation's website, you can find that full syllabus. So you can see all of the material, the text, um, classic and contemporary, that um, you would be experiencing as a War Studies Fellow. So I believe it's six o'clock and it looks like we have General McMaster and Dr. Kagan online. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Brian, and we can get on to the main event. Fantastic. Thanks so much for all the thoughtful questions, everybody. It's a real privilege for me to turn the stage over to Dr. Kim Kagan, who I already shared as a longtime mentor of mine. After establishing herself as an accomplished academic at West Point and other schools, she went on to found the Institute for the Study of War in 2007. She and I crossed paths again in Iraq when she was advising General Petraeus during one of the most intense phases of the campaign that became known as the surge about which she wrote the preeminent military history. While continuing to establish ISW's reputation for nonpartisan, apolitical, fact-based analysis, she went on to advise multiple commanders in Afghanistan, again during one of the darker periods of the war there. I'm thrilled to be a part of her team at ISW, and I turn it over to her for the part of the evening I know you've all truly been waiting for. Thanks so much, Brian. Thank you so much, Cheryl. It's really good to be here with the Greater War Studies community today. Uh, I see a number of our uh, wonderful alumni uh, here uh, this evening, and obviously prospective students for War Studies, Political Studies, uh, and other programs. Um, and it is an a special pleasure to welcome uh, this evening a dear friend, an incredible mentor, uh, and an incredible scholar and soldier, General H.R. McMaster. Um, I have known H.R. Uh, for, for too long uh, and have watched his career blossom. Uh, when I, when we first met, uh, he was, he was a lowly captain or, or uh, early major in the United States Army, uh, and obviously has had an incredible trajectory through his military career, uh, commanding some of the most fabulous units, uh, in the United States Army, 
uh, serving in Iraq uh, and Afghanistan uh, at critical junctions. Um, he is now, of course, uh, after his tenure as national security advisor, um, happily, happily living in California. Uh, and it, he is the Fuad and Michelle Ajani Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Uh, General McMaster is going to uh, share today so much of his wisdom. I'm going to ask him uh, lots of lots of tough questions, but I think you're going to see uh, what is so special about uh, soldier, scholar, statesman, uh, and really a deeply good person and a good friend. HR, thank you so much for joining us. Hey Kim, it's it's so great to be with you and to be with with uh, with everybody here, the alumni and those are fellows now. Hey, I, I just want to point out you're my mentor. I mean, I don't know what I would have done without you, Kim. I had this great fortune. I just, I just for everybody here, I just want to tell you you're 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 obviously benefiting from the you know from the curricula and from the you know from the sessions that, that you have, but you're also benefiting from the relationships you're building with one another. So, you know, I'll, I'll just tell you that Kim and I met. I mean, gosh, a long time ago, 1995, four something. Uh, and I had the good fortune of having a new office mate arrive, her husband, Fred Kagan. And Kim was was in between, I think, uh, you know, University of Virginia and Yale, I think. Thank God she was, because she, she helped me, you know, turn my dissertation into a book, finish the dissertation, turn it into a book. She's the best writer, thinker. I learned so much from her in that period. And I remember fondly, writing the conclusion of dereliction of duty on napkins in the Dong Fong restaurant in Highland Falls, New York, a restaurant that no one should ever go to. But but it was it was a great it was a it was a it was a I mean so many great memories Kim I owe you so much you know and, and thank you for what you're doing with this amazing program and for the opportunity to be with you. And hey by the way just small community in terms of relationships David Burke is in the office in that door he's behind that door right behind me he says hi. <laughs> well, I say hi. I could say hi back. It is a small community and a, a really, a really good one. Um, when HR was turning his dissertation into a book, uh, he um, the, that that is uh, that is quite a process. And I, I definitely want to speak to the author, General McMaster, uh, this evening. But I first really want to ask the soldier statesman, um, General McMaster. There are so many things uh, that these terrific college students can do um, in order to get ready uh, for their careers in national security. What I'd love to know uh, is why they should actually study history uh, or great books um, or war studies course or our politics course. Well, you know, I'll tell you, first of all, I'll just say studying history is an exercise in humility, right? Because if you ever find somebody who says, ah, God, what do I need that history for? I mean, what they're saying is, hey, I am so arrogant and egotistical that all I really know to, 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 to go forward in life and to take on responsibility and make decisions is my own experience. I don't need to learn from the experiences of others. And so it, it really is a, it's a tragedy when, when people don't appreciate history or a historical uh, in, in, their, in their approach. And I think what the study of history helps us understand, probably more than anything else, is the complex causality of events, right? And, and I think if you contrast the historian's approach, which is to ask the right question, hopefully, a good question, and then to, and then to conduct research and gather evidence and, 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 and view you know, the, the, that, 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 uh, that topic from an interdisciplinary perspective, and draw conclusions from that inquiry with maybe the approach of political science <laughs> and international relations theories, which oftentimes begin with the theory, and then and then somehow you know kind of encourage you, you know, to to find answers that are consistent with the theory or to force whatever whatever uh, you know, as you try to trace you know uh, <laughs> events back to their causes in, into this in this preconstructed kind of theoretical framework. So I think history helps you helps you think clearly about complex problems, ask the right questions, and, and understand the complex causality. I think you become more adept at design thinking, you know, and and and, uh, and and framing complex problems. 
I think what history does is also help you understand both the agency and influence you do have over complex problems, but also the limits of your influence and agency. And, and I think so much of what we're experiencing today, Kim, is, is sort of this, you know, these extremes of either, you know, kind of overconfidence and a belief that we can, by what we decide to do or not do, uh, we, that we can, that, that we can, uh, we can force an outcome consistent with, you know, our desire, we can force a desired outcome. Uh, or, or there's a tendency to, I think these days to be kind of just resigned and to, to assume we have no agency or influence. So, uh, you know, I just think history can help you ask the right questions. It can, it's important to be able to reason by historical analogy, but you should be humble about that by understanding the, you know, the, the unique aspects of historical experience and to, and to reject simplistic analogies. But, um, you know, I, I have found it to be the most useful aspect of, of my, uh, of my career, uh, was to have the opportunity to study history, you know, in high school and as an undergraduate to read history as an officer and then to study it full time as a grad student and then of course when you really learn something uh you, is to teach it right and 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 to write it so uh i write in the in the, in the conclusion of battlegrounds uh about about the importance of history to me and and how i applied it to to one particular job as national security advisor uh but also i, I give a, a talk here at the graduate school of business on on uh, on using history to help understand complex problems, and I also tell about about how we prepared uh, for Desert Storm, our cavalry troop prepared for Desert Storm, and how important uh, the historical record was and the ex historical experience was uh, to prepare a cavalry troop for desert warfare. So, a tactical level and you know strategic policy level. If there were one historical event that you would recommend uh, these tremendous students uh, study in order to learn about decision-making, what, what would you recommend uh, that they read about and learn about? Okay, so I, you know, I, I think you can't go wrong with Sir Michael Howard's advice like, ever, right? So, so what he's, he basically said is to, to learn from history, you have to study it in width, depth, and context. Right. And and what studying history and with right read, you know, reading some maybe synthetic histories that, that trace sort of the evolution of historical phenomenon and experiences over time. I'm thinking John Keegan's you know, face of battle. Right. To understand, you know, the, the changes in, in tactics uh, and the, the changes, uh, the, the changes in, in technology, the change in social changes and how they affected the conduct of battle. Right. And what he did is he chose like a piece of ground and said, OK. You know, how, how can we, how did, how did battle change here uh, over what, what, five centuries, right? So, so, uh, so I think that, that, uh, that, that, that is a way to understand, to, to understand width, uh, history and width. And you know, what that does is I think it helps you understand the balance between continuity and change. And, and in Keegan's book, right, just to stick with that, you know, Keegan was focused a lot on change, right, in that book, right? You had the, you had the age of, of infantry. Then you had the age of cavalry, which was the best age for sure. Then you then you had <laughs> then you had techno technological changes, right, that affected tactics and so forth. So it was a lot about change. But in the end, in the conclusion, he basically says there's a fundamental continuity about battle, and he said battle is about the dis is aimed at the disintegration of human groups. And he says what battles have in common is human. It's the struggle of men and women trying to reconcile their instinct for self-preservation with the achievement of some aim over which others are trying to kill them. And then he has this great paragraph, you know, about uh, this sort of a dialectic because it's about, it's about fear and courage and back and forth. And, you know, that has resonated with me. Uh, and, and, and what I did is a, as a, you know, as a lieutenant and on after reading that book, is I said, okay, I'm not going to let my human group disintegrate. You know, I'm going to, I want to focus on, on what what keeps units combat effective, right? Which keeps which is cohesion and confidence, and that's really what drove my approach to leading units in peacetime and, and in in combat was just that recognition of continuity. Change. So with, then he said, you know, you have to study history in depth, and this is then you could read your know, campaign studies, specific campaign studies, like or about one battle. I'm thinking of, God, what's a good example here? Uh, gosh, it's Blumenson's Battle of the Generals. Right. How about that? Right. That's that's one, you know, that that's that's one battle fillets gap. And then what he does is he compares and contrasts 
uh, different commanders and how they viewed kind of the same circumstances and, and whether they had a bias for action or inaction. And, and he makes the, the point that I think a lot of really good military history reveals is that the best commanders see opportunities where others see only difficulties. And they understand the importance of the psychological dimension of war and seizing the initiative. And, and so you look at a battle like Filet's Gap and then you see kind of the tidy outlines of, of history, you know, dissolve in the word this is Michael Howard, I'm paraphrasing him again. And, and, and you, you really see the human dimension of, of, of war there as well. And, and also, you know, these historians who have a gift uh, like Kim does to write about command, the eye of command, you know, and, and, to, and to, under, to understand from an ancient historical perspective, you know, how, what are these continuities again? So, you know, and so a topic in depth like command, or um, I'm trying to think uh, of another example here, or those who, who help you look at, at an experience or, 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 or an, an outcome and understand it from different levels. Rick Atkinson, I think, writes incredibly well from the policy level, like down to the platoon and back up. I mean, it's phenomenal the way he can move you around and, you know, from platoon to headquarters, to Washington, to London, the back. I mean, and so, so depth, right. And then in context to study history in, in context of political and social dynamics and, and technology. And, and, uh, and so it, it, and, you know, an example of this would be, um, you know, the changes in, in warfare or innovation uh, and integration of technology from historical perspectives might be uh, Williamson Murray's book, uh, Innovation in the Interwar Period, for example. Uh, or it could be uh, Elting Morrison's book, Men, Machines, in Modern Times. You know, not a politically correct title anymore, but it was in the 1960s. It was written in the 60s. So, but, it, but essentially what you can do is you can glean from, these, from, from this kind of history context of what, what, what effect does technology have on war generally? You know, is it decisive? Is, has there ever been a silver bullet in war? Yeah, I'm not really, although we keep looking for it and assuming it's gonna happen. Uh, so so you, I think uh, war as an extension of politics, I'm thinking of our friend Nadia Shadlow's book, right? War in the Art of Governance, you know, or, uh, or, or Conrad Crane's essay that highlights that, you know, we've never been able to never do it again, right? To consolidate gains and sustainable political outcomes. When somebody says, oh, that nation building stuff, we never should have been doing that in Iraq and Afghanistan. You can recognize, well, what were we going to, what were we going to do? Just take, and I can't use, can I use Seinfeld analogies with your generation? You guys probably, I'm going to try, I'm going to try one anyway. Take the George Costanza approach to war, just leave on a high note. Well, that doesn't work, right? I mean, consolidation of gains has never been an optional phase in, in war, uh, except for raids, right? Which are military operations of a short duration, limited purpose and plan withdrawal. So anyway, I, I think you can't go wrong with width, depth, and context, and and you should read you know, Michael Howard's great essay, right? The use and abuse of military history, where he makes those, where he makes these points about how to read history and how to think about it. All right, we have a phenomenal uh, queue of questions, um, and I know Nico uh, has teed up the very first one. Um, so, uh, Nico, who's who's got the first question? Nolan, uh, Nolan Musselwhite, uh, come on screen, uh, introduce yourself very quickly, and uh, you get the first question. General McMaster, thank you so much for speaking to us today. Um, my name is Nolan Musselwhite. I'm a student at Princeton University. Um, and so you've written a lot in the past about the warrior ethos and how one of the problems in today's American military landscape is that we've seen an erosion of the warrior ethos. So what steps do you see to recovering the warrior ethos and how can that play a role in continuing American military preeminence? Yeah, I, I, think, it, I think it comes down to this issue of continuity and change again, right? We, we, we always want to say, hey, really, 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 really this time, the next war will be fundamentally different from all those that have gone before it. But again, going back to the well of Michael Howard, you know, he said that wars resemble each other more than they resemble any other human activity. And, and, and so the warrior ethos is important to preserve because it's the essence of, uh, of your ability to fight. Um, I think we lose focus on that in, in, in peacetime sometimes, right? And, and we haven't been at peace very long. We're still really not at peace, right? I mean, you know, the war in Afghanistan has just entered a more, you know, a new, more dangerous phase. You know, we keep wanting to say, okay, we're out of, we're out of Iraq. You know, we're not going to do any more combat operations. We're just advising now. Well, what happened a couple weeks ago? What was that? I mean, you know, because we're because you know, you know, the enemy has a say, right? I mean, 
we keep wanting to end the endless wars, but are are these terrorists, the jihadist terrorists, are waging an endless jihad against us? So, so I, I think, and and you know, I, I don't want to be critical in a partisan way at all. But if you read the Secretary of the Army's latest priority document, I mean, there's nothing in there about fighting. I mean, nothing at all. I mean, I, I so I mean, what's the army for again? You know, so I just think this is something that that happens periodically, and what you need is you need leadership. And you need leadership that who understands his, who understand history, uh, and understand the essential elements of combat effectiveness, which which in, includes maintaining the ethos necessary uh, to to defeat enemies uh, in an activity uh, that involves killing and the prospect of death, right? And we we want to sanitize it. You know, I, I wrote an essay a long time ago, uh, not that long ago, but you know, gosh, well, probably a long time ago, six years ago, seven years ago. In, in the New York Times, it's called the pipe dream of easy war. And, and, uh, and I was concerned about it then, right? We were still fighting, you know, we're still in the middle of the wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And it, there was already this dynamic creeping in again. If you look at kind of the revolution in military affairs, you know, uh, thinking of, of uh, Fred's book, uh, Finding the Target, you know, and, and, and a monograph I wrote. Kim, did you write that with Fred? Were you guys to write that together? Okay. So, but, uh, you know, I, I think that it, that it happened again. So I, I talk about like these fallacies in 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 uh, fallacies <laughs> re related to thinking about future war. And uh, do, should I do the four fallacies, Kim? Should I go back to the greatest hits? <laughs> like, I, I, I I love the four fallacies. Uh, <laughs> so, we, did, well, we can take four fallacies and six questions, um, and okay. uh, we'll call it an evening. Yep. So we'll see. Please, we'll see if I can God. remember them. Okay, if I can remember. Them. Okay, the first fallacy is the vampire fallacy. You can't kill it because it's like a vampire it keeps coming back like every ten years, and that's really it's a fallacy that is strategic bombing in a new guise every ten years. And again, it's based on emerging technologies. You know, now it's AI. Right, sprinkle AI on stuff, and it becomes different. Well, you know what AI AI, AI is a is a group of of complementary technologies. Right, in, involving you know big data analytics and you know and facial recognition or um, or you know geotagging and categorization of data in a way that makes it more accessible to big data analytics and so forth. Uh, it's and you know uh, automated decision making tools and, and and so forth. So is that going to fundamentally change war? Well, you know I'm kind of skeptical about it, right? Because much of the information that's going to go into databases is going to be wrong or contradictory, like all information is in, in war. Uh, and, and, uh, and there are going to be all sorts of, of dynamics associated with combat uh, that are resistant to a simple technological uh, solution. You know, and and these, this has to do with continuities in the nature of war again. So the vampire fallacy, right? Strategic bombing into new guys. And if you want to see kind of the, a critique of air power that's kind of funny and really good, it's Mark Clodfelder's book, Beneficial Bombing. It's awesome, you know, <laughs> and uh, and and, uh, and it, the, the second the second of these is the zero dark thirty fallacy, right? All we have to do is do raids, and then you can you can take the George Costanza approach to war. You just leave on a high note, but but raids are for again limited purpose and plan withdrawal. I call this the zero dark thirty you know fallacy. We can just you know take out the latest you know the latest leader of an organization, and then you know then it's over. Well, how how did that work out like in Afghanistan? How did that work out against Al Qaeda or ISIS and so forth? You need a sustained effort typically, and you and you need to be able to bridge again into that sustained uh, outcome. And then you know the third the third fallacy, um, you know, is is that uh, you know essentially that that you know you can just say no to war, right? You think you just consider that wars are are optional. Um, and, and this is the RSVP fallacy, you know, thank you for your kind invitation to the war. The United States regrets it is unable to attend. And, and so we think we could just, we can just disengage from it. Well, you know, how's that working out, you know, in, 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 in terms of Russian new generation warfare, right. Or how did that work out on nine 11 certainly and so forth. So sometimes wars choose you rather than the other way around, or as GK Chesterton has said, you know, war may not be the best way of settling differences, but it's the only way to ensure they're not settled for you. And then, and then, um, and then, you know, and then uh, finally, um, gosh, what's what's the other what fallacy am I missing? Oh, the oh, the uh, neutral of, Omaha. of Omaha, wild kingdom fallacy. Okay, now this is going to take some explanation to your generation, but when when back when America was wholesome, like in my generation, like right, there weren't any real housewives of anything that we were watching, man. There was none of that stuff. And what we what we what we uh, 
watched on Sunday nights was a wonderful world of Disney. Okay. Super wholesome. And then we would watch like the mutual of Omaha's wild kingdom. And it was narrated by a guy named Marlon Perkins. And he had like, kind of like a little hunting sport coat on, but he had a tie. He was, you know, he, he wasn't out with the wildlife. His assistant, Jim was, Jim was always like down with the crocodiles or the, you know, the wildebeest, whatever. And, and so the, the, the idea with this fallacy is that, Hey, we don't have to get our hands dirty, right? We don't have to get in the mud. We'll just get other armies, proxies to fight for us. But of course, you know, we, you know, we ignore then principal agent issues, right? And 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 recognize you know, don't fail to recognize that that others may not see it as in their interest to, to fight, you know, and risk death for, you know, for our interests. So anyway, I think it's, I mean, I'm sorry for such a long answer to your question, but I think it's because we're self-delusional about war and we and we want to go back to these fallacies about future war and think, okay, hey, the next war really is going to be different. We have uh, the next question from Madeline McMaster. Good, good name. Strong name um, there. Hi, I'm Madeline McMaster. I go to Villanova. Um, and my question was, what's one of the most difficult situations you have faced and how has your experience with the humanities helped you with it? My experience in the humanities. Okay. All right. So, gosh. All right. Madeline, we must be related. I'm telling you. Are we related? That would be really cool if we were. I'm sure we are. I'm sure we are. Okay, so so the the uh, I could give you the whole you know McMaster history, but I won't do that. Okay, but here here's I'll just give you one example. Right? There are many many examples, right? That that uh, that have helped me. So what, one one of these examples was we were operating in South Baghdad, you know, in in the so-called Triangle of Death area. We're operating in an area that was really taken over by Al Qaeda in Iraq. We we're fully engaged in a fight. And just as we're getting there, we get a change of mission to go to Western Nineveh province, Iraq. And a completely different dynamic, you know, 22,000 square kilometers, 281 miles of border with Syria. Uh, there's a sectarian civil war and an ethnic civil war going on there. Al Qaeda's taken over huge parts of the territory, including uh, the vast majority of a city of 250,000 people and made it their training base and their support base. So we had to, you know, we had to start, you know, our, our squadron that I set up there at first as the, as the advanced squadron, they called it Operation Cold Fusion because we had prepared to go into South Baghdad, but now, man, we're just going right into it. And so how do we understand? How do we understand that complex environment? And I think it was my, my training education as a historian helped me ask the right questions. Uh, obviously, I had my own experience in, in Iraq from 2003 to 2004. This is now 2005. Uh, and I'm back in command of a, of a CAV squadron. I'd been in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, earlier and seen the countries and understand a little bit of the dynamics there. Uh, and, and that helped me ask the right questions, but then I needed help. I needed help from historians who could help me think it through. So I called the history department at West Point. I said, hey, uh, do you guys know of, of anybody who studied, you know, uh, Nineveh, Nineveh province? And, and, uh, and the historical spirits there, any Middle Eastern historians, what happened to be one in the history department, a guy named Dan Bernard, uh, <laughs> Major Dan Bernard, uh, who had studied the British revolt against, uh, a, 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 you know, against the, uh, the, the, or the, the tribal revolt against the British in the 1930s. And, uh, and so I <laughs> said, put him on a plane, man. I mean, get him over here. And what he did is he went to Columbia University Library. He got the, he got the journals. You know, many of the journals from the from the British officers who were there with the tribal sketches and their memoirs, and he, he scanned them in. He was sending PDF files over to us. You know, and of course things change. You know, between 1930, you know, and 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 you know 2005, but a lot of things stay the same, right? And and uh, and so he comes over. He helps us understand the area. Uh, he helps us ask the right questions. We we understand what the agendas are of the various groups, the Turkmen Shia versus the Turkmen Sunni, and the and the Kurds and the different Arab tribes, which are divided. And so, you know, it's just one example of understanding that to, you know, understanding the, the recent past is essential to being able to conceive of the present and certainly to make a projection into the future. So um, that's, that's one example. Thanks for the question. A great Thank question, no, no, no surprise coming from McMaster, you know. And we have a big, we have a big John Bach McMaster was a famous historian in, in uh, University of Pennsylvania as well. So it's in the genes, you know. We have next, Will Kale. Will, I hope I said your last name right. You will reintroduce yourself. 
Hi, thank you. Yeah, my name is Will Kayam. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, really great fan, fan of your work. Um, so this question is for um, General Will Master. Um, so in, in your book, Battlegrounds, you aptly characterize the transform policy as an obsession for control. And it is true, given that the PLA has sought after a more coercive route uh, for po political capitulation of um, Taiwan and maritime aggression in the South China Sea. My question was um, on, uh, I guess, well, as Field Marshal Barnard Montgomery once said, um, don't go fighting with your land army on the mainland in Asia. Um, so exactly what do you think is the um, future of land warfare in, um, in, in the Indo-Pacific? Um, there's a lot of um, emphasis currently on um, that it would take place in the South China Sea. But um, yeah, what do you think is the future of land warfare? Why are some land warfare more decisive than others in operation? What determines the military outcome of land campaigns or operations? Right, right. Okay, so you know, I think that and this is a super important question because there are those who, who want to focus on just developing capabilities that operate in the relatively fluid media of the maritime, uh, aerospace, cyberspace domains, right? And, and this is consistent with the idea that war can be relatively fast, cheap, efficient, waged from standoff range, and it can be reduced essentially uh, to uh, to a targeting exercise. People want to to equate targeting to tactics to operations to strategy. If we just strike enough things, you know, everything will be great. You know, and and uh, Conrad Crane, an old colleague of ours in the history department at West Point, uh, he has a he has a great essay on this called "The Lore of the Strike." It's a short essay worth checking out, and and. Uh, and so that, that what's different about land? Well, hey, people live there, right? I mean, I think until dolphins grow thumbs, right? I mean, I mean, you're really going to have to affect your know, life on land. And to get to sustainable political outcomes, you have to create security conditions, right? That are conducive to that political outcome. And then also, you know, if you're going to to you know to defeat an enemy, you have to convince that enemy the enemy that cannot accomplish their objectives through the use of force. It's hard to do that only with the transitory capabilities that you have available by, to apply onto land from the other fluid media. So there, there are many examples of this, right, that we could use from, from history. Kim could tell you from ancient history, right, is the, the way that the Spartans could defeat the Athenian fleet is, you know, they took over the ports, they had nowhere to go, right? Then they were kind of stuck right after that. Um, and you can think of an analogy to that of, you know, we're not gonna invade and occupy China. I mean, no. But there, but there, but you know, the, I think the war against Germany was fought in theaters outside of Germany, wasn't it? You know, or, or you know, the war against Japan in World War II, right? Was was fought in territories outside of, of Japan. And if you if you think about the menace that is facing Ukraine now, it's a land force that everybody's concerned about, right? I mean, it's not it's not the missiles, it's not the it's not Russia's air superiority, it's the ability to drive into Kiev and say, this is ours now. Right and 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 to, and to really create conditions on the ground in Donetsk and, and Luhansk as they have right or in Crimea by a land force, and if you think about the Syrian civil war right we did all kinds of stuff remotely there too initially, uh, and then and then in the northeastern part of the country, uh, but can you imagine uh, if there was you know it, what, what would happen uh, if an if an American you know armored brigade drove toward Damascus. I think Assad and the Russians, everybody would be kind of freaked out about that. Not that we would want to do that. It might not make, you might not want to do from a policy perspective, but you're creating conditions where you can actually force a, a, an outcome. And, and, uh, and so the control of territory and populations and resources are still going to be vital to achieving sustainable outcomes. And of course, that was the case in Afghanistan, right? We kept saying, remember, oh, there's no military solution to Afghanistan. Hey, the Taliban came up with one, didn't they? I think they came up with one. And the, and the Taliban, I should say the Taliban uh, and their Al-Qaeda, uh, you know, allies uh, and, and the Haqqani Network allies and their, and their Pakistani ISI sponsors and their, and, their, and their Gulf state donors, you know, and I mean, not state donors, but people in the Gulf states donating. So uh, I, I just think that, that wars are decided. They're decided on land. And that doesn't mean, you know, you need naval and air forces and space forces and cyber forces less. No, you need them more, but they all have to operate together. And I think this idea of multi-domain operations, I think that's right. I mean, I think it's a good way to think about it. Um, and what, what's the, is it, remember, I, I'm a big fan of Admiral Corbett, okay, as opposed to Mahan. And our good friend, Jakob Griegel, 
wrote an awesome article in the Naval War College Review, this issue. You've got to check it out. All right. And it's uh, it's on the limits of sea power and good on the Naval, the Naval War College for, for publishing it. But Jakob is a great historian, and, and I think he makes a very compelling case for the, the, the for the the uh, you know the, the, the remaining relevance of, of land power. And also, hey, how about the reassure allies? You know, I mean, they didn't say, hey, conduct a few more fl- flyovers over Poland, and we'll feel a lot better. You know, or Romania or Bulgaria. They sent, you know, they sent troops there for for, for a reason. Awesome. I think we have time for one more question. Good evening, Ms. Kagan, sir. Uh, I'm a former Sergeant of Marines, current sophomore at Wesleyan University. Long-time listener, first-time caller. Uh, sir, you would mentioned uh, normative elements in war and what can be understood through the study of history, and then mentioned uh, through other questions the recent developments or recent, more recent developments in the use of data and uh, artificial intelligence. I'm wondering if there's anything you'd qualify as truly having the potential to fundamentally change warfare or something that's uh, unprecedented and ill understood in the nature of war. Okay, so I mean, I think there are, there are a few dynamics that we have to, you know, obviously be on top of, uh, because they could, I mean, uh, they could fundamentally, I would say fundamentally change the character of warfare. And, and none of the trends are good, right? So one of the trends we've kind of skirted around, I was kind of Saying, hey, it doesn't change kind of the nature of war, but it does change the character of warfare, and that's that's uh, that's the whole range of artificial intelligence technologies as they relate to automated decision making and the application of force without humans in or on the loop. Okay, so you've seen the killer bots video, right? It's, it's that kind of a scenario where uh, where where you you have kind of this uh, these these autonomous systems which can wreak havoc. You know, now there are countermeasures to that that we have to race to develop, but. But that's 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 one that's one trend that I think is disturbing. The other is is the is the proliferation of 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 weapons of mass destruction and and more, the more more and more actors getting access to some of the most destructive weapons on Earth. And of course, I would put nuclear, you know, at, at the top of that. But I would also put biological weapons in there as well. So we saw what happened with what I think is almost certainly to have come from the Wuhan lab, you know, uh, uh, the virus, COVID-19 virus. And, and, uh, and we know that adversaries are working on the ability to engineer, uh, you know, bi- bio, um, you know, uh, biological uh, agents and, and viruses uh, in a way that could be, de- that could be devastating, right, to, to populations. And this is why we're, you know, that's why the Department of Defense sunk money in years ago when I was uh, in, part of involved in the making decisions on where to invest. We, invest a lot of money in MNRA technologies uh, and our requirement documents said that we needed to be able to prototype a vaccine uh, in 24 hours and then and then produce it at scale what rapidly and those investments those defense investments are what I think you know helped uh, reduce you know the the, 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 the uh, price we paid for COVID during COVID and then and then uh, and then finally you know this is nothing new right you're gonna be like okay everybody knows that but it's it's, uh, it's it's cyber and and the effect that cyber can have in the physical world as we become more and more vulnerable to it uh, because of the Internet of Things uh, the, and the, just more reliance on exquisite systems that are connected uh, to to the Internet and can and then and, and they can be susceptible to to offensive cyber and our defensive capabilities and and the hardening of enterprises and infrastructure and 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 everything from you know financial transactions everything and this is linked to space threats as well. I think these are all, all all disturbing new trends in the character of warfare. So, um, I, I think that 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 uh, and none of it's you know. And I would add also, I mean, hypersonics and 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 missile capabilities, uh, because you know, if you just think about the situation Israel's in, right? Israel's in a really tough spot uh, because of of geography and hostile neighbors and hostile neighbors equipped with long range systems long resistance, which as right now are not very precise. Now, if you think about, you know, missiles and expand, right, that geogra- that threat geographically and increase the precision, you can see how, how we, you know, we could be at risk from, you know, somebody very far away, like Kim Jong-un, right? Or, and this is what Iran is trying to do, is to hold the Gulf states and Israel hostage to their missile capabilities. 
What is that going to take? It goes back to the earlier question. You know, you can strike back at it, but if you look at the 2006 Lebanon war, for example, you know, you can't solve that problem, that land-based long range problem uh, from the air alone. You would have to have forces that could deploy rapidly into unexpected locations and transition immediately into reconnaissance and then offensive operations to destroy that capability and to deny the enemy the ability of using, I mean, probably urban terrain, you know, uh, to, to launch these, these kind of uh, weapons at you. So I think those are some of the trends we have to be really worried about. We've had such an incredible uh, exchange with General McMaster. Your questions have been absolutely fabulous. Uh, and he embodies uh, in so many ways uh, what uh, we hope that you can be and become uh, in your own career. So I really wanna thank him for joining us, for participating in this evening's session, uh, for participating also as a guest faculty member uh, in the War Studies program uh, in the summer and for uh, being a tremendous soldier, scholar, statesman. Uh, thank you, General McMaster, for all that you've done uh, and for your great insights today. Hey, thanks, Kim, for all you're doing and all the Hurtog Foundation is doing uh, to bring this, this incredibly talented group of young people together. What a privilege it is to be with you. Take care, you guys. Thank you. I'll turn back over to Cheryl and to Brian uh, for any closing remarks. Great, everyone. Please remember to apply. Our final deadline is March 1st, which is coming up in just a few weeks. Um, our website is hertogfoundation.org. If you have any questions about our summer programs, please do feel free to reach out to us or to Brian if you have questions about war studies. And thanks again for joining us.